got to have the proper foundation before you can build the right building. So let's go to Deuteronomy 32. And we're in Deuteronomy 32, beginning in verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. We're in Deuteronomy 32, beginning from verse 1. And the Bible says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. So who will speak? God will speak. He says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of whose mouth? Of God's mouth. And the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. So God says that when he speaks, that his doctrine is like rain. That his doctrine is like the latter, like the early and latter rain is what he says, when God speaks. But notice the speaking that Jesus re revealed to his disciples that he said to be careful of this type of speaking, be careful of these type of doctrines. Turn with me to Matthew 16. Because God wants to rain upon you. God wants to pour out his speaking, his teaching, his doctrine. But we have to beware of certain other kinds of doctrines. We're turning to Matthew. Matthew 16. Notice what the Bible says. Matthew 16, before we look at the wheat and the tares, just laying a foundation. Because God wants to pour out his rain. How many of you want his rain? I want God to speak, not man. Notice what he says. We're in Matthew 16, beginning in verse 6. The Bible says, Then Jesus said unto the disciples, Unto them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, of the Sadducees, and the Sadducees. So he told them to beware of what? The leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now, who were the Pharisees and the Sadducees? The church leadership. All right. Notice what it continues to say. He explains what this leaven is. And they reason among themselves, saying, it is because we have taken no bread. Which, when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not understand? Neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? You see, the disciples' minds were on earthly things. And Jesus was talking to them of heavenly things or spiritual things, but their mind wasn't there. They were still focused on earthly things. Jesus wasn't talking about things to eat when he said leaven. He was used, see, bread in the Bible represents what? The word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds. So when he said leaven, he said beware. In other words, beware of the teaching or beware of the doctrine of the scribes and Pharisees is what he was saying. And so, notice what he continues to say in verse 10. Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. You see this? So he was, he was cautioning them to beware. In other words, pay it, be, 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 don't, don't allow yourself to fall under the false teaching or the false doctrines of the scribes and Pharisees. You see, there's been a false interpretation that has been given to the wheat and tares, and it's because it's coming from the church leaders. Is because we've been looking at, looking at it through false lens. Not through the lens of the spirit of prophecy. Not through the lens of the Holy Spirit comparing scripture with scripture. But through the lens of the church leaders. And this is why Jesus cautioned his disciples, beware of their leaven. In other words, beware of their doctrine, their false teaching. Them putting their construction upon the scriptures rather than a true construction according to the word of God. Or according to the Holy Spirit of God. 
which is line upon line, precept upon precept. Turn with me to Isaiah 28, our last scripture of foundation before we, we get into the parable of the wind tears. Isaiah 28, notice what the Bible says. Because the Bible calls this, this type of teaching in Isaiah 28, it calls it the latter rain or the refreshing of the Lord. Notice what it says in Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28, beginning in verse 9, and the Bible says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And to whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the what? Refreshing, Refreshing yet they would not hear. You see, it's this kind of teaching that's going to give true rest to the people. In other words, the teaching of line upon line, precept upon precept. In other words, this kind of teaching, this type of, uh, will help to understand doctrine. This type of teaching will bring the endowment of the Holy Spirit. But without this kind of teaching, no Holy Spirit, no refreshing, no rest. And this is, this, is not this what Christ came to bring? Did not Christ come to give rest? Did not Christ come to refresh the soul? To, to make to understand true doctrine? Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13 is where we find the parable of the wheat and the tares. The wheat and the tares. And this parable is given right after he gives a previous parable where he lays the foundation that the seed is the word of God. That the seed, the word of God, is, and is what allows one to actually bear fruit. And that in every congregation and in every individual, they are separated into four distinct groups. The, your heart can represent a stony heart. Your heart can represent a thorny heart. Your heart can be a wayside heart or it can be a good soil heart and the condition of the heart and what the word is able to accomplish determines which one you fall into so but the foundation must be understood that the seed is the word of god and so this is what allows to truly bring spring up and actually bear fruit or actually produce what christ desires for it to truly produce and so with that notice what it says in verse 24 Matthew 13 and verse 24, the Bible says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Verse 30, key verse, let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but, the, but gather the wheat into what? Into my barn. Key verse now, verse, the key to understanding the wheat and the tares is this verse, and when you turn the page, the other verses that explain this parable, because the disciples then came to Jesus after he had preached this, they said they didn't quite understand it. And so notice what it says now in verse 36 of the same chapter. Verse 36 of the same chapter, and it says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, 
And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of who? The wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are who? The angels. The angels. The angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be a wailing and gnashing of teeth. Verse 43, another key verse. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, where do we see the same words, who hath ears to hear, let him hear? In the book of Revelation. So that already gives us a signal as to where we can turn in, in involving to understand this parable, right? But I want you to look at something here in verse 30. Notice verse 30. I want to read this again because that's another key verse. It says, Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. I want to, before we go to Revelation, I want to show you another passage that talks about the same language as is used here in verse 30. Hold your finger, or actually you don't have to hold your finger because we won't come back right now. Let's go to Matthew 3, Matthew 3, and verse 12. And in Matthew 3, we find the ministry of John the Baptist. Now, where was John the Baptist preaching? In the wilderness. Who was John's dad? Zacharias. What was Zacharias' position? He was a happy, in other words, he was the conference president, to make it plain. John the Baptist's dad was either a union president or conference president, but he, he still did not go to the school of the rabbi. I'm sorry, yeah, he didn't go to the school of the rabbis. He was trained by the Holy Spirit. He had a specific purpose and mission in preparing the first advent of Christ. In other words, John was preaching present truth. John was studying Bible prophecy, and this is what allowed John to recognize that Jesus was the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He helped them to understand that they needed to overcome sin, and by overcoming sin, they needed to have an experience of repentance. True repentance, meaning a true turning away from sin and walking in this newness of life. This is what John helped them to understand, and John was even baptizing as well. So whose authority did John, who gave John his authority? God did, right? The Holy Spirit did. God, so in other words, who gives the authority to baptize? God does, right? The, the, the ordination for ministry comes from God, not from man. And so this is the work of John the Baptist in preparation for the first advent. This is an example to you and I when we talk about preparation for the second advent. Notice what it says in verse 12 concerning John. This is actually John speaking, and notice what he says. It says, Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. You know, God uses natural examples to explain spiritual things. And unless you understand the sifting and the, uh, the, the, the threshing of wheat, you won't understand this parable. You see, anybody here ever threshed, actually threshed wheat? Anybody actually ever? If to thresh wheat, wheat grows on a stalk, right? You have stalks, and the, the, the kernels... Or, or, or balls of wheat are at the end of the stalk. 
and you lay those, you, you, you take a group, let's say you put it down on a table, and you beat it with a hammer that's about this size. And you beat it, and what it does is it separates, listen now, it separates the wheat from the chaff as you beat it. That's what happens. It separates the, the wheat from the chaff as you beat it continuously. And you have to continually beat it until all the wheat has been separated from that chaff. Now the chaff, you don't need it. You don't need the chaff because you can't do anything with it. It's not, there's no, you know, no, you know, great amount of nutrients or fiber or, or anything beneficial or nourishing to the body in the chaff. So there is a separation that is had in the beating of the stalks of wheat. <laughs> I mean, this is so amazing as I, as I was studying this. And God gave, it, gave me even more this morning as I was studying. So, so, but unless you understand this aspect, you can't, you can't really understand this parable. But that's what happens with the wheat. There is a, a beating of it and a separation that takes place where you throw away the chaff. And, and so when it talks about the garner here in verse 12, the garner is the barn. That's what a garner is. If you look it up in the, uh, in the, not Hebrew, but in the Greek, when you look up the word garner, garner is a barn. In other words, a place to store. Now, when you store something, do you want to store it where the rats or the rodents can come and get it? No, you don't. You store it in a safe place that nothing can come and attack it or, you know, or eat it, right? That's what you do. So, so when you look at the ministry of John, John was preaching a message. He was an angel. In other words, he was a messenger that was preaching a message of present truth to the people. And as he was preaching, he was actually separating individuals from the apostasy of the scribes and Pharisees as he was beating out the sins of the people as he was preaching. So, so this is the work that is going on, that is to go forward at this time. Notice this quotation. This one is not on your handout, so I apologize. I wasn't able to fit this quotation on your handout, but it's taken from the Southern Watchman, March 21st, 1905. The Southern Watchman, March 21st, 1905. In this, it says, the work of John the Baptist and the work of those who in the last days go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah to arouse the people from their apathy are in many respects the same. His work is a type of the work that must be done in this age. It's not on your handout. Yeah, this one's not on your handout. It says, this work is a type of work that must be done in this age. So it's interesting to me that John, his dad is a conference president, and yet he didn't go to Andrews. He didn't go to Oakwood. He didn't go to Southern. He didn't go to Loma Linda. God had a specific, specific purpose and calling. Why? Because the, the priesthood had become corrupt. Are you with me? The priesthood had become corrupt. And as a result, so that his ministry was not tainted by the corruption of the priesthood, God says, no, I'm going to train you myself. I don't want you to go there. Now, with this, I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Because in our examination of the wheat and the tares, we also saw, we also saw that there are angels, there's reapers, there's a harvest in Matthew 13 concerning the wheat and the tares. Didn't we see that? We saw angels, we saw reaping, and we saw a harvest. Let's see if we see the same thing in Revelation 14. Let's see if we see the same thing. We're in Revelation 14, beginning in verse 6. And the Bible says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of a... So we do, have, do we have angels here in Revelation 14? Yes. Notice what it says, verse 7. I'm sorry, verse 8. It says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen. Okay, let's come down to verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying... So do we have angels here? Yes, yes we do. Okay. All right, so we see that we have angels. Let's see if there's a harvest and a reaping. Let's pick up in verse 
14. So after this message goes to the entire world, the three angels' messages, which is present truth, which is the only message to go to the entire world before Jesus comes. Notice, what, notice the result of this message being preached, the three angels' messages being preached in all the world. Notice what it says in verse 14. Revelation 14 and verse 14, the Bible says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and what? Reap. reap. For the time has come to the, for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So do we have angels here in Revelation 14? Yes. Do we have reaping? Yes. Do we have har a harvest? Yes. So can we safely say that we can could you put these scriptures together, Matthew 13 and Revelation 14? Yes. Absolutely. And when we look at this, I want you to understand that it is the message that is to do the separating of the wheat from the tares. It is the message. The message. In other words, those who hold to the message are going to be bound together. And those who don't hold to the message are going to be bound together. And it is the message that does the separating of the wheat and the tares. But I don't want you to see it with, with just my word. I want you to see it more so in the scriptures. So let's turn to Galatians 4 and verse 14. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 14. Because we need to understand what these angels represent. What do these angels represent? Do they represent... Uh, uh, angels that we can't see that are flying in the in the air or do they represent something else do they represent a, a messenger of God one who comes bearing a message from God notice what it says we're going to Galatians chapter 4 Galatians chapter 4 notice what the Bible says line upon line precept upon precept here a little there a little Galatians 4 and verse 14, and the Bible says, And my, this is Paul speaking now, and my temptation which was in my flesh, ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as what? As an angel of God. So Paul said that he was received by the church in Galatia as an angel of God. In other words, as a messenger from God. Does God have messengers that are going forward today preaching the three angels' message? Yes. yes, he does. Yes, he does. Turn with me to your handout, the very last quotation on the first page. Last quotation on the first page. Notice what it says. It says, The angel represented in prophecy as delivering this message symbolizes a class of who? Amen. Faithful men. You mean it's not church leaders? Not, not general conference presidents? The, it just said that the angel represented in prophecy as delivering this message symbolizes a class of faithful men who, obedient to the promptings of God's spirit and teachings of his word, proclaim this warning to who? And to the, to the inhabitants of the earth. This message was not to be committed to the religious leaders of the people. Now you see why we have to read the spirit of prophecy. Notice what it continues to say. Turn the page with me, please. Let's, let's, look, let's continue. Notice what it says. Speaking of the church leaders, they had failed to preserve their connection with God and had refused the light from heaven. Therefore, they were not of the number described by the apostle Paul but ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of light and the children of the day. Ye are not of the night nor of darkness. So, and that's 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 and 5. So, showing us that because the church leaders had departed from the message, in other words, they departed from the word of God. Are you with me? They departed from God's word. They had separated themselves from God. You see, any time we choose to separate from God's message or separate from God's word, we, we, we are divorcing ourselves from Jesus, if you will, by doing such. 
and this is what happened. And so therefore, God is choosing John the Baptist's, whom he's giving the message to and saying, go preach my message. This is what is happening. Notice what it continues to say. It, this is taken from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 199. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 199. Notice what it continues to say. The watchmen upon the walls of Zion should be the first to catch the tidings of the Savior's advent. The first to lift their voices to proclaim him near. The first to warn the people to prepare for his coming. But they were what? They were at ease, dreaming of peace and safety, while the people were asleep in their sins. Jesus saw his church like the barren fig tree, covered with pretentious leaves, yet destitute of precious fruit. There was a boastful observance of, a form, of the forms of religion, while the spirit of true humility, penitence, and faith, which alone could render the service acceptable to God, was lacking. Instead of the graces of the Spirit, there were manifested pride, formalism, vainglory, selfishness, oppression. A backsliding church closed their eyes to the signs of the times. God did not forsake them or suffer his faithfulness to fail, but they departed from him and separated themselves from his love as they refused to comply with the conditions his promises were not fulfilled to them. Brothers and sisters, God has his John the Baptists that are going forth bearing his message today. And these are the ones who are preaching his message, which is to separate the chaff from the wheat. It's the message that does the dividing. Notice, what, turn back with me to the first page. And look at the quotation, the, the third from the bottom, the third quotation from the bottom. Notice what it says. I then saw the third angel. You see that? I then saw the third angel, said my accompanying angel, fearful is his work, awful is his mission. He is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares and seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garner. These things should engross how much? The whole mind. The whole mind. And what else? The whole Is your Sabbath school lesson doing that? Think about it. These things should engross the whole mind, the whole attention. Sabbath school lesson not doing that, brothers and sisters. So we have to ask ourselves, what message are we listening to? A message that's preparing us to receive the mark of the beast? Or a message that's preparing us to be sealed in God's true message, the three angels' message, which is present truth for now. This is what the flock needs. It is present truth the flock needs right now. Not milk. Not milk, but present truth. And this is what pr will prepare the, the flock to be sealed in preparation for the second coming of Jesus. So as we examine these quotes, it's clearly evident it is clearly evident that the message, the first, second, and third angel's message, is what will separate, is what will separate the wheat from the chaff. Let us pray. Loving Father, we ask that you would take firm hold of our minds, that you would help us to understand these truths because the enemy does not want us to grasp these truths. Help us, dear Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Loving Father, so, so, so we thank you for, for gracing us with thy, with thy spirit, with thy presence. So this just showed us that the message is what does the dividing, is, is what does the separating, nothing else. And so often it is said, well, oh, we can't, we can't separate. What the wheat and the tares is actually teaching in the parable is, is let's say we're in an assembly where the truth is being preached. And someone doesn't readily receive it quickly as we expect them to. And so then we say, oh, we need to get them away from our assembly because they haven't jumped on board. Where you're prematurely trying to remove individuals that are, haven't fully established themselves upon the message. And that's what it's saying. Don't, don't get rid of them so quickly is what Christ is saying here in Matthew 13. He says, be careful how you're quick to disfellowship 
or remove from church assembly those who have not established a true foundation for their feet. This is what it's, it's actually saying in Matthew 13. Not saying that, that there's no, to be no division. The message does the dividing. And those who are on board of the three angel will be where the three angels is preached, will be experiencing the message, and will be sealed for the heavenly garner. So, so this is a correct understanding, but there's more to be understood, brothers and sisters, because as we examine the scriptures, or as, as we search the scriptures, you're going to see that God has given us actually a story in the Bible that, that, that helps us understand to a greater degree. Now, earlier it talked about gathering the, the wheat into the barn or the garner, and it talked about um, also, it talked about the, the chaff for the fire. So turn with me to Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Because the enemy wants to use fear to keep you from going to the John the Baptist that he's raising up across the country. The enemy wants to use fear to, to keep you from, from being where God needs you to be so you can receive of his Holy Spirit. Notice what it continues to say. Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Isaiah 41 and verse 10, the Bible says... Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Let's skip down to verse 14. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument. So who's this threshing instrument? Israel. Israel is supposed to be his threshing instrument. Wasn't John the Baptist a threshing instrument that was used by God? He says, Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument, having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small and shalt make them the hills as, as chaff. Is the same language here as we saw in Matthew 3.12? Absolutely. Line upon line, precept upon precept, verse 16. It says, Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them, and thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. Notice what it continues to say, verse 17. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will heal them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the in the valley. I'm sorry, fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of what? Water. Where was John the Baptist preaching? Then God just said He's going to make His wilderness a pool of water. You see this? So so can we safely say that this is talking about John the Baptist and those who take on the spirit and power of Elijah and preach and do a ministry as John? The same thing, brothers and sisters. It says, I will make a, the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. God says he will give his spirit in the wilderness where no man dwells. Out in the wilderness, God says, that's where I'm going to pour out my spirit. God, remember, the Holy Spirit in times of old was poured out in the upper room. It wasn't in the synagogue. It wasn't where the scribes and Pharisees were when the Holy Spirit was poured out. It was in the upper room. Who was in the upper room? The disciples. You mean the, you mean the, the common people? You mean those who didn't have all those letters behind their name? You mean those who didn't go to Andrew, Southern, and Oakwood, and Loma Linda? Watch out now. Notice what it continues to say. By God pouring out his spirit, notice the result of this in verse 19. Notice the result in verse 19, and it says, I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shitta tree, and the myrtle, and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree, and the pine, and the box tree together, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this, the Holy One of Israel hath created it. Who did it? God did it. So when John was out in the wilderness, who did that? And when John the Baptist says that God raises up are preaching today in the wilderness, who did it? No man will receive the glory but God. 
And so this is the work that God is doing to separate the wheat from the chaff concerning the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13. But notice what it continues to say. Let's move a step further. We have to move quickly. Our time is escaping. Micah 4. Micah chapter 4. Notice what the Bible says. God said this is his refreshing line upon line, precept upon precept. Micah 4 and verse 11. Micah's right after the book of Jonah and Obadiah and right before the book of Nahum and Habakkuk. We're in Micah chapter 4 and verse 11. Notice what it says, Micah 4 and verse 11, and it says, Now also many nations are gathered against thee. So many nations are gathered against thee that say, Let her be defiled, and let our eye look upon Zion. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel. For he shall gather them as the sheaves into the what? What are sheaves? What are, when, when somebody binds sheep, what are they binding? They're buying wheat. Wheat. That's right. Sheaves, you know, uh, uh, bringing in the sheaves. You ever sang that song? When we bring in the sheaves, it's talking about binding wheat. Where you bind the wheat together and the chaff, you cast aside and throw away. God is in the business of binding his wheat at this time in sheaves that they may be established, that they may be settled and sealed in the truth. This is the work that God is doing right now. And he's using John the Baptist to do it at this present hour. Notice what it continues to say in verse 13. And it says, Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hoofs brass, and thou shalt do what? Beat in pieces. Don't you have to beat the, the wheat in order to, to separate it from the chaff? Yes, you do. Beat in pieces many people and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord. In other words, their money unto the Lord and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. Same language, brothers and sisters. This is talking about the wheat and the tares. God is in the business of binding. And what is he going to use to bind them? Turn with me to Isaiah. You're right. It's the word, but it's more than that. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 8. Notice what he says in Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah 8 and verse 16, notice what God is, God is using to bind up his people, to seal his people. Notice what it says in Isaiah 8 and verse 16. The Bible says, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. What is God using to seal his people? His law and his testimony. So showing us that the law of God is supreme. The law of God is the standard by which we are judged. The law of God is to be kept and obeyed even in God's sanctuary. So you're telling me all these announcements on the Sabbath that have nothing to do with the announcements? Is that the hold, upholding of God's law? No. no. When, when you're told to just mark it on your tithe envelope that you're paying for this, but just, just mark it on your tithe envelope and, and put it in the offering plate, but you're actually paying for something on the Sabbath. That's breaking the Sabbath, brothers and sisters. That's buying and selling on the Sabbath. Even if they tell you to put it on, that's apostasy. The breaking of God's Sabbath. On the Sabbath, you're being told this from the pulpit. Announcements made about basketball games and socials. He says, speak not thine own words. Do not thine own things, nor thine own pleasures on my holy day. That's what he said. The law is being lowered in the scribes and Pharisees of the present day, and John the Baptists are raising up the standard, brothers and sisters. Let's, let's, let's move further. Actually, no, there's more that, that God wants to say. Let's look at verse 11, because God has something to say here. Notice what he says. We're in Isaiah 11 and verse 11. I'm sorry, Isaiah 8, I apologize. Isaiah 8 and verse 11, and it says... For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. What's a confederacy? I'm sorry? You said the, the, I think I heard him say the general conference. Brothers and sisters, 
It's any confederation of men that's not according to the will of God. It could be the general conference. It could be trade unions. It could be any association that is not according to the will of God. And now you're being told that bisexuals and homosexuals and LBG, LGBT community can serve in church leadership. It's right on the website. It's right on the website. It's right on the website. That, that, that those of the LGBT community, it says non-practicing LGBTs can serve in church leadership. What, what, hold on, hold on. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? So what you think is going to happen? So if destruction happens there and you're there, what's going to happen? God is not a respecter of persons, brothers and sisters. And because God does not execute swift judgment, men are bold to sin openly before God. But God will not be trifled with long. He will not. And he will make it clear who his children are and who are not. And so when we look at Eli and his sons, did God bring judgment upon them? When we look at Nadab and Abihu, did God bring judgment on them? Yes. And he's no different. We serve the same God, and he can, and in his own timing, will do the same thing today. Verse 13, verse 13, it says, Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Christians. Many Christians are going to be snared. They're going to, be, they're going to stumble and they're going to be broken. Why? Because they're a part of this confederacy. That's why. But God is saying, bind up the testimony and seal the law among his disciples, and I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for the signs and for the wonders in Israel, whom the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Are you looking for him? Are you looking for Jesus? Because there's a preparation to be made for those who are looking for Jesus. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. That's the word of the Lord. Prepare to meet thy God. Judges, chapter 6. Judges, chapter 6. We see Gideon was threshing wheat. Gideon was threshing wheat. And there are spiritual lessons. This story of Gideon is very much connected to the wheat and the tares. Because first, Gideon broke down the idols... That was in his father's house. That was his first work. And after breaking down the idols, then he was able to go make war on the Midianites. And God is using his Gideons or his John the Baptists today who are protesting against sin. In other words, they're sighing and crying for the abominations that are done in Jerusalem. Because those are the only ones that are going to be sealed. Ezekiel 9 makes that very clear. Only those who sigh and cry for the abominations in Jerusalem, that means in the church, are going to be sealed. Only those who sigh and cry. Meaning, they're a Protestant. They are protesting the sins. And just as the Protestants of old were led to leave the church of their fathers, it's no different today. Because right. Jesus ended up having to leave the church of his fathers. I'm going to read that quote to you at the end. Page 232 of Desire of Ages. Remind me. Page 232 of Desire of Ages. But notice what it says here in Judges 6 concerning Gideon. Notice verse 11. Notice what the Bible says. And there came a what? That's right. And there came an angel of the Lord. Do we have angels in Revelation 14 and in Matthew 13? Yes, we do. Notice what it can do. And it came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, and Abizrite, and his son Gideon did what? Do we have wheat in Matthew 13? Yes, we do. Notice what it continues to say. By the winepress to hide it from who? The Midianites. the Midianites were the enemies of God's people. But first, God gave him a mission, 
and said, look, first, you got to go break down the idols in your father's house. That was the first mission before he could go against the enemies of God. Now, with this, turn with me to look at the same chapter. Look at verse 15. Same chapter, verse 15, and notice what it says. It says, And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewithal shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am what? The least in my father's house. In other words, he saw his unworthiness. He recognized that he was not uh, 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 anyone of, of any magnitude, of any stature, of any position or, or status. No letters behind his name, but yet he was willing to do God's will, and that's who God chose. You see, God doesn't choose men the way that we choose men. God says, I don't look on the outward appearance. I look at, I look at the heart. That's what God says. <coughs> Notice, now I'm going to read this to you in your hearing. It says this. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And base things of the world and things that are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 27 and 28. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. That was chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. God doesn't choose the way man chooses. God, is, God works in a, his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are God's ways higher than our ways. We're in Judges 6. Let us get down now to verse 33. Notice what it says in verse 33. It says, Then all the Midianites, we're in verse 33 of Judges 6, it says, Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of where? Keep note of that. We're going to come back to this. It says, The children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he did what? He blew a trumpet, he blew a trumpet and Abizer was gathered after him. Now notice, it says that Gideon did what? Blew a trumpet. So the Spirit of God came on him, and he blew a trumpet. What does it mean to blow a trumpet? Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, show my, show my people their transgression in the house of Jacob their sins. That's what it means to blow a trumpet. It means to preach against sin. It means to call sin what it is and not to be afraid. It means to protest. It means to be a Protestant. It means to uplift the word of God and not the word of man. That's what it means to blow a trumpet spiritually. And notice, even the Holy Spirit is brought out in this story. Turn with me to, to verse 38 now, the same chapter. Verse 37, rather. Verse 37. And it says, Behold, I will put fleece of wool on the floor. Actually, let's, in verse 36, so you understand the context. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew on the fleece only, be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wring the dew out of the fleece, and a bowl of, full of water. So that's how drenched the wool was, that he was able to fill a bowl full of water. Now what does water represent in the Bible? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. What does wool represent? Christ, or Christians, or those who are after Christ. Notice, notice before I deal with that, let's go to verse 39. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me. And I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. You see, brothers and sisters, there's a quotation in the Spirit of Prophecy where she says that the Holy Spirit will be falling on hearts, and, and others won't receive it. That, and they won't recognize the work of God, where it'll fall on some hearts and it won't fall on other hearts. And this is what God is showing us here when we look at it falling on the, on the dew falling on the wool and falling on the outside of the wool, where we need to make sure that we're making our calling and election sure. 
We need to make sure that we're examining ourselves to see whether or not we're in the faith and receiving of God's spirit. We need to make sure that we're in the place in which God has designed to pour out his spirit. Because in Isaiah 41, it said that the Holy Spirit was going to be in the wilderness. And so God uses the water to also test his people. Because as Gideon brought the people before the water, those who got on their, or at first, those who were fearful had to go home. You see, you can't be afraid doing God's work. You have to be bold. You see, you can't be afraid because they say, oh, I'm going to disfellowship you, or, or just because a little persecution comes your way that you're going to be willing to give up. You have to be bold doing God's work because the enemy comes after you. Yes, he does. And so you have to be prepared. You have to make sure that you have a spiritual experience in preparation through the means of the Holy Spirit so that you can withstand the wiles of the, of the devil. You have to make sure that you have the armor of God on so that you can be able to stand in these last days. And so the, 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 the other lesson then, so, so first, he brought them to the water, and those who were fearful had to go home. So it went from 30-something thousand to, what, 3,000 or 10,000, was it? I think it was 10,000, something like that. So, that. so you saw that there was a separating. You saw that there was a separating taking place, or a cleansing, if you will. So that was the first step, Joanna. That was the first step. I need you to pay attention. And so uh, uh, then after that, he brought them to the water, and um, those who got on their knees all the way, in other words, they weren't fully prepared for war. The, those who got on their knees, those had to go home. Only those who, who, who still had their sword in their hand and they were still ready for anything to happen, those were the ones, even though they were drinking, they still were prepared for anything that would happen. Those were the ones that he used, and it was 300. That's a small, that's a small number to go against thousands of men in the Midianites. Thousands, you know, thousands. So when we, when we look at this, there are so many lessons that God is showing, but also he wants you to understand that this message of Gideon is directly applicable for the last days. Notice what it says in Judges chapter, let's skip over to chapter 7 now and come over to verse 25. And notice the two leaders of the Midianites, and it says, And they took two princes of the Midianites, and they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb, and Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian, and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. So now, they slew Oreb, and they slew Zeb, and where did they slay them? By the winepress. Also, when Gideon was threshing wheat, where was he threshing wheat? By the winepress. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 14. And notice what happens to, for those who don't receive this message, to those who don't receive the three angels' message, present truth for the hour. Notice what happens. Revelation 14 and verse 18, notice what happens. Revelation 14 and verse 18, notice what happens. And it says, And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the what? Clusters. Clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and it cast it in the great winepress of what? Showing you that those who reject this message, what are they going to receive? The wrath of God. What is the wrath of God? Seven last plagues. Notice what it continues to say in verse 20. And the wine press was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the wine press, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Brothers and sisters, just a profession of name of a Christian or of a seven day Adventist, that's not going to save you. Just by mere profession. You have to be sealed in this message. In other words, you have to have an experience in this message. And this is what will protect you when the seven last plagues will be poured out. But if we're not being where the message is being preached, if we're listening to ministers that are not preaching present truth, not preparing the flock to receive the seal of God, how can we be prepared? How can we be ready when Jesus comes? Turn with me to 
Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, because when Gideon went on his conquering mission, it stated that those who he conquered were from Midian. And the children of Midian were from where? The children of where? It said the east. Remember that? The children of the east. Notice what else comes from the east in Revelation 7 and verse 1. Notice what else comes from the east and it says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from where? The east. The east having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. You see, God is trying to seal or settle and establish you in the truth, is what he's trying to do. Not to where you're back and forth, not to where you're wavering in and out, not to where you're double-minded, in sin and out of sin. No, God wants to seal you to where you can't be moved, where you're established, established upon that rock, Christ Jesus. And this is what will protect you from the seven last plagues. This experience with Jesus and the sealing message is what will allow you to be garnered with, and bind with the wheat and sealed with his disciples. Not a preparing for the burning with the chaff. God is, is, is trying to get us ready, but we have to move with God when God moves. When the children of Israel were in the wilderness, God used the cloud and the fire to lead them. And when God moved, the children of Israel had to move. And God is doing the same thing today where he's using his John the Baptists to, to, to preach the truth and his people need to move with God because we're living in the last days and time is short. He says a short work will he accomplish in the earth. And when you look at what, what Donald Trump is currently doing, this man is moving quickly. He's trying to pass things very quickly and we saw in the first two weeks him using many executive orders. He says he wants to destroy this wall of church and state is what he wants to do. Things are going to happen very rapidly, brothers and sisters, and we need to have our eyes wide open and ready to be sealed with Jesus so that we can be protected. Only the sealing message will protect you. An experience in the sealing message will protect you. Notice what it continues to say as we close Revelation 18. Because God is not just calling people from the nominal Adventist churches, he's also calling people out from Babylon. Notice what he says in Revelation 18 and verse 1. And it says that after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. The Seventh-day Adventist church is not Babylon. I want to make that very clear. But the Seventh-day Adventist church is in apostasy. And God is calling us out from sin and out from apostasy. And those who are in the fallen churches, meaning those who are upholding Sunday sacredness and the immortality of the soul, God is calling them out to hear John the Baptist. That's what God is doing right now. He's calling them out from the fallen churches. In other words, the daughters of Rome. He's calling them out of the Methodist church. He's calling them out of the Baptist church. He's calling them out of the Methodist church and the Presbyterian church and all of the fallen churches. He's calling them out into one truth, one faith, one baptism. He's calling them out from those apostasies or those false teachings and false doctrines in the wine of Babylon. He's calling them out that he may have one fold and one shepherd. So, so when we understand this, brothers and sisters, I want you to see it very clearly from early writings. The last quotation on the page. 
very clearly. And I want you to please go home and prayerfully read this handout. Prayerfully. If you, if you want a copy of this handout and you're watching this via online, please email me and I will email you a copy of this handout. But notice what it says in the last quotation. It says, I saw that God has honest children among who? The nominal Adventists and the fallen churches. And before the plagues shall be poured out, ministers and people will be called out from these churches. From what churches? When she says these churches, she said nominal Adventists and the fallen churches. They will be called out from these churches and will gladly receive the truth. Satan knows this, and before the loud cry of the third angel is given, he raises an excitement in these religious bodies that those who have rejected the three angels' message or rejected the truth may think that God is with them. In other words, those who are saying, oh, uh, spirit of prophecy, oh, we don't have to read that. Those who are saying, Oh, you know, Ellen White, oh, her, her, her writings are no longer authoritative. Her writings are no longer uh, 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 can define doctrine. You know, we can, we can cast those aside. You know, they can only enrich your Christian experience. Those who have done so, he says, God is not with them. That's what it just said. He says, those who have rejected the truth may think that God is with them. So Satan is, is actually doing a false revival in those assemblies. So if, it, if Satan is doing a false, a false revival, then whose spirit is there? So an evil spirit. Not the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit is given to them that obey him. Notice what it continues to say. He hopes to deceive the honest. In other words, Satan hopes to deceive the honest and lead them to think that God is still working for the churches, but the light will shine and all who are honest will leave the fallen churches and take their stand with who? So where's the remnant? They're in the truth. They're where the truth is. They're where John the Baptist. That's where the remnant are. Last quote that I want to read to you. I, I promise you, Desire of Ages, page 232 as we close. Page 232. And I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, that when you talk about the sealing message, you're talking about the Sabbath truth, but it's more than just the Sabbath truth. Because when you really understand the Sabbath, the Sabbath is more than just a day. The Sabbath is an experience where Christ dwells in your heart by faith, enabling you to rest from sin. The six days of the week in preparation for the Sabbath. Are you with me? Where Christ dwells in your heart by faith, the six days of the week enabling you to rest from sin through those six days so that you can keep the Sabbath holy. So that now the Sabbath can truly be the blessing that God desires for it to be. This is the correct understanding when we talk about Sabbath keeping and observing the Sabbath. Not just going to church on Saturday. I'm talking about having a communion with Jesus. A relationship, a, a, a deep, intimate experience. A marriage, if you will, with Christ. Last quotation. This is Desire of Ages, page 232. I'm not sure the title of that chapter, but I know it's page 232. It says, the Sanhedrin, do, does anyone know what the Sanhedrin is? What's the Sanhedrin? The General Conference, thank you. <laughs> we want to make it plain, we want to make it plain that he may read, may run, amen? Notice what it says. It says, the Sanhedrin had rejected Christ's message and was bent upon his death. Therefore, Jesus departed from Jerusalem, from the priest, the temple, the religious leaders, the people who had been instructed in the law, and turned to another class to proclaim his message and to gather out those who should carry the gospel to all nations. Do you hear this? It said that he would gather them out. In other words, take them out from the denomination is what that's saying. As the light and life of men was rejected by the ecclesiastical authorities in the days of Christ, so it has been rejected in every succeeding generation. Again and again, the history of Christ's withdrawal from Judea has been repeated. When the reformers preached the word of God, they had no thought 
of separating themselves from the established church. But the religious leaders would not tolerate the light. And those that bore it were forced to seek another class who were longing for the truth. In our day, few of the professed followers of the reformers are actuated by their spirit. Few are listening for the voice of God and ready to accept truth in whatever guise it may, pre it be, it may be presented. Often those who follow in the steps of the reformers are forced to turn away from the churches they love in order to declare the plain teaching of the word of God. And many times those who are seeking for light are by the same teaching obliged to leave the church of their fathers that they may render obedience. Protestant. Protestantism is right now on atta being attacked because the Pope has said or, or it has been stated that the Pope is going to sign a document that the Lutherans have already signed saying that the protest is over, that we're no longer protesting. On October 31st of this year, the Pope's supposed to sign that document. And to my understanding, there's supposed to be representatives from the Seventh-day Adventist Church there. But it's already evident that the protest is over. Why? Because we have the great hope. It's already evident. So in other words, everything that exposes the papacy, everything that exposes our message or preaches the true message has already been discarded. We're there, brothers and sisters. We're, we're here at the end of time. And God is trying to seal us. God is trying to bind us. How many of you want to be sealed? And God wants you to be sealed. God wants us to be sealed. He doesn't want any of his children lost. God says, he says he is... He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God, God wants everyone saved, but we have to let him save us in his appointed way. And so as we look at this, we want to understand that the wheat and tares is dealing with, God, when God's saying let both grow together, he is saying don't prematurely remove people from the church that haven't been fully established. That's what he's saying. Because he gave other parables in how to deal with church leadership apostasy. He gave the shepherd and the sheep. And he said, let's turn to John 10 as we close. Notice what he says in John 10. Because in John 10, he talks about strangers. He talks about hirelings. He talks about thieves and robbers. Who was he talking about? Who was he talking about when he said that? He was talking about church leadership. See, the wheat and the tares is not dealing with church leadership. The wheat and the tares is talking about this premature separation and that there will come a separation when the three angels' message goes forward. And it is going forward now. But notice what it says now in John 10. See, we have three parables that teach us in dealing with church leadership. You have the vineyard. That's in Matthew 21. He says, I'm going to let out my, my vineyard unto other husbandmen. That's in that. He also gave you... Uh, the man that built his house, his house upon sand and the rock. That's another one. And then we also have John chapter 10 that shows us how we should deal with those who aren't preaching the truth or those who aren't uh, uh, following after the ways of Christ. Notice what it says. We're in John 10 and verse 3 as we close. John 10 and verse 3 and it says, To him the porter openeth. John 10 and verse 3. To him the porter openeth. And the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and does what? Leadeth them out. Leadeth them out from what? Apostasy. From those who are in apostasy. He says, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow who? Follow him. In other words, they follow his word, because that's what it means to follow Christ. They follow his word. They follow him, and for they know his voice. His voice is the word. Verse 5, and a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. What do they do with strangers? They flee. Are you fleeing? That's what we have to ask ourselves. Are you fleeing? Because it says they flee from the voice of strangers. God doesn't want any of his children lost, brothers and sisters. God is willing that all should be saved. And our responsibility is to follow him through his word. His word shall be a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy path. My prayer is that as we sing that song, uh, uh, let every lamp 
be burning bright. For the darkest hour is nearing, the darkest hour of earth's long night before the Lord's appearing. Then trim your lamps, my brethren dear, then trim your lamps with godly fear, then trim your lamps, let every lamp be burning. This is, the, this is the time in which we are to trim our lamps and make sure that there is oil in our lamps that me, we may be prepared to go in with the bridegroom to meet him in peace. This is the experience that God wants us to have. But we must be where the oil is being dispersed. We must be where the Holy Spirit is being poured out. We must be where God will bind us and seal us in his law. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you so much for your clear word that you've given us came straight from heaven, from heaven's bakery. And Lord, as we continue to partake of this meal, we pray that it would take deep root in our hearts, that it may bear fruit, that we would contemplate these things, that we would take the hand out and go back and, look and see whether these things are so. Lord, give us a deeper experience, we ask, that we may be protected, that we may have shelter in the storm that is approaching. Lord, we thank you so much for giving us your son, Jesus, who has died on the cross. May we not cheapen nor uh, uh, do disregard to his cross that, that he did for us. May we meditate, may we contemplate what the cross truly means and how we must take up our cross and follow him. Lord, we pray that you would guide us through the remaining hours of your Sabbath, guiding through the remaining hours of this life as we prepare to meet Jesus. May your will be done as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus is coming again.